Uh, hey, I'm Stacy. I am super excited to just be looking at you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had written down something in the years of reading your newsletter about creativity, so I thought today would be a good day to ask that. Um, but you said creativity takes both conscious preparation and training as well as the unconscious. And I'm wondering in your life where the unconscious parts have showed up. Where the conscious or the unconscious? Unconscious. The unconscious. I mean, I think so much of what we call creativity is this quiet combinatorial work that our minds do, taking pieces that we've lodged back there over the years of just being alive and awake to life and combining them into new combinations we can't force. So it's, I think so much of our best ideas are uncalculated and come from things that we've retained, you know, from all the way back to pre-conscious memory to yesterday's morning reading, you know, all of it combining in new ways. And I think actually when we try to consciously create and constitute new things, they tend to be predictable because they, they follow a pattern of everything we've always known to be true for us. And I think the most creative things have an element of self-surprise because actually we move through the world half opaque to ourselves. I mean, so much of what's going on for us is unconscious and that can be terrifying, but it's also lovely because then we have this enormous repository we don't even know is there to draw on in ways that are uncalculated and unexpected. And I think the key is to keep feeding the repository with things that just sort of are, are tokens, emissaries of aliveness and just live there until they're called on in ways you can't predict and pre-plan. Thank you. Hi. Maria, good morning. Really love to have you here and to be here with you. Really lovely to have you here and to see you in person. Mm -hmm. I discovered you actually last week, but knew you from brain pickings. I rediscovered you. So Great. Which, what a couple of us were asking, hope you could give us an insight on why brain pickings and now marginalian. Uh -huh. what, is the, what, is, what was the impetus and how does yeah. that show up for you? Thank you. Sure. Uh, I mean, I am tempted to encourage you to, I, I wrote, I, don't, I rarely write very personal things, but when I changed the name on the 15th anniversary of the project, I wrote a very personal essay about why. It's probably the best way to find it, called Becoming the Marginality, and I would read that. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so I follow you on Instagram, and I notice that you post a lot of beautiful photos of things that I imagine inspire wonder, or instill wonder in you, like I think the other day you posted a gorgeous sunset. Um, and you know, you hear a lot about how sometimes taking photos of things actually takes away from the experience. So oh, I just absolutely. wondered if you could talk a little bit about how you navigate that with your own beautiful uh, social media feed. Yeah. Sure, that's a wonderful question, and I, there is a moment I will never forget. It was 2010, so Instagram was fairly new. I was in San Francisco, I was about to do a talk, and I was driving with a friend from the Bay, I'm not sure what the geography there, but crossing that big bridge, not the Golden Gate Bridge, the other bridge, and we're sort of racing to get to this talk, and the sun was setting, we're stuck in traffic, and it was a beautiful, beautiful sunset. And I had this already reflex to like take a picture of it and post it on Instagram. And I felt sullied by it. I felt so sullied by it. And I made a pact with myself then on that bridge to not take a picture of anything ever until I've actually taken it in first. Which means that some of the most beautiful things I see, I don't document because they're fleeting. But sometimes there are moments where you can enjoy it and then capture it. And that, I mean, it's imperfect. Obviously, we're so conditioned by the culture we live in. So even I sometimes go for the phone and have to actively talk myself off of it. But it, it is a kind of practice. I, I recommend it, actually, doing this pause moment for yourself before capturing. Yeah, thank you. There's somebody Yes. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, I have been following your blog since 2009. I don't know how I came along, 
across from it, but it's been amazing. It used to be called Brain Pickings. I have two questions. First one is, what inspired you to start um, Brain Pickings? It used to be called Brain Pickings. And the second question, um, how much your inspiration comes from nature versus human thought, like art, like music, like classical musician, like in philosophers, uh, artists versus pure nature, um, the plants, the Pick animals, one of the questions. The Pick one of the two. <laughs> the second one. The, the second, second one. one. Okay, well, well, that's great. Where, the, you can where your true inspiration <laughs> comes from? So I spend a lot of time in and with nature to this day, deliberately. And I will say most of my writing actually takes place on foot, I walk a lot, I walk hours and hours, I spend a lot of time in a forest and I walk the forest for hours and most of the actual creative aspect of it, particularly for the long form things like my books and things like that, most of that comes while I'm outside. The rest of it at the keyboard is just transcription. But what happens out there, it's not like, oh, I'm looking at a tree and this is the inspiration and I'm like just gonna be this vessel for this inspiration, it's more of, that default mode network thing of the brain suddenly being liberated from its habit and then these things lodged, lodged back there in the unconscious that accumulated over years from everything I've ever read, everything I've ever listened to or seen somehow come back in ways that, you know, for me personally, peripatetically, work so much better than statically. I have a question from Livestream from Chandra. Chandra. Thank you, Kyle, for feeding them to me. Um, <laughs> what does Maria do in first moments of consciousness each day? In first moments of consciousness? Basically, e what do you do when every you day? after you wake up? Oh, yeah. I um, am a creature of habit. I'm trying to live a little wilder, but I am very <laughs> habitual. Uh, I wake up. The first thing I do is meditate. Um, after attending to biological needs, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> um, I meditate and then I work out. During my workout, I usually, depending on if I'm inside or outside, if I'm indoors, I read. If I'm outdoors, I listen to something. And after that, I have a breakfast concoction that is the same thing every day, which I love. And then I, and then I write. Then I... I would say sit down, but actually I stand. I stand up and, and write until my brain fizzles out, which is about midday. My brain stops being creative. It can be very productive, but n nothing good comes out. I can do administrative work the second half of the day. And I think it's also very important to know when you kind of lose that edge and need to divert the energies. I love the fact that we're really close friends and I didn't know this about you. So, Chandra, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you. You have someone? Hey. Um, so, I think many people, I'm up here. Wait, where are you? Hold on. I am, I'm in the back, in oh, the middle. Oh, I see you. In the shadows. With the yellow sweater. A question yeah. from the shadows. Okay. <laughs> Is it that shadowy back here? <laughs> So I think, many, I think many people would describe you as more creative than average. But of course, our internal feeling of creativity varies over time. Sometimes we feel more creative, sometimes we feel less. I was curious, uh, observing yourself, what patterns have you noticed when you are more creative versus less creative? What have you eating, doing, anything? Hmm. Right. I um, I am afflicted with frequent visitations of depression, and sometimes it gets very bad, and in those periods, it is not possible to be creative. But at the same time, in those periods, it's all the more important to try, because somebody asked earlier how I began this project and a large part of it, there were many things at play, but a large part of it was that I needed to pull myself out of my first major depression and I think the best way to feel the edge of life is to become interested, to just be interested. And then you become interesting by default, we call that creativity, but that's really being interesting, you know. 
And a lot of it is a kind of survival tactic for those periods. Um, I have also noticed, I mean, the basic things like being physically tired. I mean, our bodies, we are such biomechanical puppets and resting well, sleeping well is a basic form of self-respect that I think is just fundamental to being able to do what your calling is or what your purpose is. So I try to do that and when I'm more rested, I feel more creative. It's that feeling on the brain when, when things are connecting, that kind of sparkle of associations, I, I know that feeling very well and I'm very attuned to when it's on and when it's not. And yeah, feeling rested, feeling calm, having a meditation practice, a mindfulness practice helps me a lot. Um, but also I think it's okay sometimes to just acknowledge that you're in the pits and to stay there for as long as it needs to live itself through you and then pull yourself up, you know, with coming back to whatever it is your calling is. Thank you. Oh, hi, good morning. Stand up. Good morning. Hi, good morning. My question is probably going to be a little more superficial than the other ones. I just noticed your outfit, so I wondered if it was Bowie inspired. What about the outfit? Your, if it was David Bowie inspired, that's what I'm getting the vibe. Oh from. my God, I love. I, I would love for it to be Bowie inspired. Actually the back. Uh, the back. Well, the thing is, this. So I had this. This is so funny. These patches. Uh, I do. I used to do for five years a show called The Universe in Verse. Maybe some people have gone to it here. Yeah, uh, which was poetry, science, cosmic perspective, a lot of sort of that wonder stuff. And every season had a patch, like inspired by NASA mission patches. So these are some of them. And uh, the back of it, I, I met this woman who had an amazing bomber with a Saturn embroidery on it. And I asked her about it and I ended up making this like friend in London out of a random conversation with a stranger and had them embroider this. But uh, yeah, funny. I mean, I don't really... Turn around, Maria. We want to see it. Turn around. Turn around, yeah. There we Here go. There we go. <laughs> the pants are like $10 pants, which I wear in Tina's honor, because Tina, when, when we were studio mates, when I first moved to New York, Tina and I were studio mates, and she still is very into red. In fact, I'm very shocked she's not wearing red today. And like my color was yellow and her color was red, and we would give each other things, or like she would always send me cool designy yellow things she finds, and... And so today I wear red in Tina's honor. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> I have a question from the live stream. Thank you, Kyle. Leah Redmond is asking, Maria, how do you balance the relinquishing of control creativity, th creativity thrives on with the practical demands of creative work, like deadlines? How do you not just spiral out, out in it Infinitely, ah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Lee, I'm not doing your question justice. How do you not just spiral out infinitely in interestingness? <laughs> um, well, I'm both very lucky and very unlucky that I am my own boss and I have a pretty intense boss. <laughs> and so the notion of deadlines as such doesn't really exist. I'm, I've created my life so that I'm kind of not beholden to anyone else, which, you know, early on was hard, but now it's, it works for me. And there is, of course, that problem of when does it become from creative to compulsive? And I've struggled with it over the years because you can get on a role that, you know, has a adaptive value to a point and then becomes maladaptive. Um, but for me, I realized sometime last year, the last few years have been challenging, and at some point last year, I realized that I'd stopped writing daily, which I used to do, and I hadn't done it consciously. It had just kind of slipped. I mean, I, typically in the first 12 years of my project, I would publish at least one essay a day every single day. There was a compulsive year when I was doing three a day, which is insane. I mean, why would anyone do that? And um, Debbie's looking at me knowingly. <laughs> and uh, then somehow it fell off. And sometime last year, I realized that not having the rhythm was detrimental to my 
internal stability. So I made a deliberate practice of make, giving myself a deadline every day to write one piece, however short, however light. And sometimes I would go on a very long rabbit hole about some forgotten scientist that would take me three days to research and three weeks to write and, you know. But making the daily habit really helped. So it is a constant negotiation between creating enough structure and control to, to, to have a rhythm that feels vitalizing and not making it be compulsive and freedom limiting in, in a self-imposed way. Is this the last one? All right. Okay, yes. last I've question. I've been told that this is, to say that this is the last question. So I'll, I'll ask two and happy to pick one if I need to. First, how do you decide what to consume? Movies, books. Second question, you mentioned how um, curiosity drives a lot of the things that we do not need to exist, but we make them, and they add a lot of joy to the world. Um, my question is, is, this, is there an implied validation of some aspect of capitalism in this statement? An implied validation of? Capitalism, some aspects of capitalism. Say I, more. I, a lot of these things probably wouldn't exist, wouldn't exist in the shape that we have, or wouldn't exist in the, the accessibility that we have to them without capitalism. Hmm. I mean, I grew up in communism, and we had music, and we had ice cream. No, so you're that's... Not. <laughs> we, of course, but I'm, I'm going like a level deeper in, in, in terms of like on the human level, on the universal level. Like for some of these products to exist, for them, some of these products to be like, to, to get to the perfect shape that they are, to allow people to work in music um, in a way that is, um, in a way that is, can make a livelihood. Like there are so many aspects that, okay, I, I, I hear what I you're saying. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'm not, I'm not, okay. I'm not advocating. I'm just. Gotcha. I will answer an adjacent question because you're touching on something very important that I think kind of got lost a little bit. So, late-stage capitalism has many downsides for creative culture. It also has many upsides of making things available, but I will answer it through the lens of music because I think that's a really great example of what has happened, which is that the machinery behind economics right, the, the kind of buying and selling of product has diminished or has devalued the artistic and spiritual substance of an art form. And we have been complicit in that. We have been complicit in letting Silicon Valley take music and make of it a thing for selling apps and selling services, completely erasing the human element of it, the fact that these are human beings making art with their gift, with something they were born with, that is like not to be taken for granted. And all of a sudden, it's a currency for a very capitalist enterprise. And I think first, we need to be aware of that because music is really the cautionary tale of what will happen to all of culture if we let it go. I mean, really think about it, what's happened to music, and also that we have agency in this. We have agency. We don't have to go along with the script that late-stage capitalism in Silicon Valley are giving us. And music is a great place to start. Find musicians, find musicians whose music you love and support them directly. So go to their shows, buy their records, donate to their project, whatever it is, bypass that, that kind of, you know, economic hostage situation that we've put them in together. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>